Good evening. Welcome to Girlfriend Therapy Radio. It feels good to hear that music again, guys. It's been uh, just about almost a year since I have been on the airwaves of Girlfriend Therapy Radio. And I have to tell you, I am both nervous. <laughs> you can hear you know, the, the panting in my voice. But I'm also excited because um, I'm excited about what God is showing me in this season and also uh, excited about the gift that he has given me and the platform that he has given me um, in this uh, under the mantle of this ministry that is girlfriend therapy ministry. And so, uh, like I said, it's been a year <laughs> and there has been a lot, a lot, a lot going on um, within the world, within my life, just everywhere. Um, there's been a lot going on. And if you're listening to this live then you will know that we are, well, today is what, uh, August, uh, August of something, <laughs> and you will know that, what is the date? August the 5th, and you will know that we are in the middle, depending on where you are in the world, of a pandemic. Like, there is so much going on. There's a lot of social unrest, a lot of uh, political unrest. There's a lot of racial unrest. Like, there's so much going on on top of a pandemic that the world without question uh, as a whole, is really just kind of struggling through some things right now. And, uh, you know, I believe that it is the responsibility of ministers and leaders in the faith to help people to navigate this season. And I tell you, I've spent the uh, most part of this uh, just really trying to hear from God and, uh, you know, with regard to the ministry and the direction and what it is that he would have me talk about or say or share um, during this season. And uh, in, in, a, in the midst of all of this, you know, you can, as you can imagine, there are a lot of voices. There are a lot of people talking about a lot of stuff. <laughs> there are a lot of things that is, that's being politicized uh, that typically shouldn't be politicized, but there is, there's a lot of that. Um, everything from, you know, racial injustice or, you know, social injustice, like how is any of that politicized? But it is. Uh, you have people, you know, on one side, you know, uh, saying Black Lives Matter, and then in response to that, you have other people saying All Lives Matter. Um, there's just a lot that's going on. And although both statements are true, people don't seem to believe that they both can be true at the same time. And so what's happening is that there are a lot of people jumping on different sides. And you see this everywhere. Um, you see it everywhere. There's a lot of protests going on across the world. Um, just a lot going on. And as I'm, you know, kind of sitting back and watching all of this happen, God was just continuing to um, press upon my spirit uh, the message of contend for the faith. And this is a message that I think is, so, I, I can't think of another message that I have given over the history or the lifetime of girlfriend therapy ministry. I cannot think of a message that has been more timely uh, than this message, Consent for the Faith. And the reason is, I'll tell you, um, uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, I, and with the pandemic, I apologize, time is, <laughs> is hard to keep up with. But a few weeks ago, I was talking with my best friend, and she was sharing with me some of the things that she's experiencing, you know, out there in Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is what we call a red state, uh, and I live here in Maryland, what we call a blue state. And so I, I was uh, surprised at how different our experiences have been uh, during this pandemic. There's a lot of, you know, protests and stuff going on surrounding the pandemic itself and how we are to respond. And, you know, do you wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? There's just a lot of back and forth. And as a result, people are becoming very aggressive in their stance. And so she was sharing with me some of the things that she's seeing in Oklahoma. And I'm thinking over some of the things that I'm seeing here in Maryland. And... I was quite surprised to learn that there are that that, that Christians are struggling to understand what side, um, or, or under not even uh, what side because we, we don't need to take a side. But I was surprised to learn that Christians were struggling with what our posture is supposed to be. So I think posture is more uh, appropriate uh, word to use here. And so as I was, again, you know, just inquiring of the Holy Spirit, what is it, like, what, what's going on, just trying to understand it, um, I came across this article, and there's this, this, this conversation that's happening around the political um, arena that is, that is saying uh, this term, white evangelical Christian. 
And I, I, I never really paid it attention. I hear a lot of people talk about it. I hear a lot of, you know, pundits use that term and that phraseology. And I didn't really stop to think, okay, what do they mean? You know, or are they just talking about white people who are Christians or like, what does that mean? And although I kind of took a step back and tried to research it, I can't say that I'm any more clear on what it means, but what I understand is uh, their agenda, their posture, and their approach to the political system. But I was saddened to learn that they have, in, in, effect, in effect, politicized the faith. And when I read that, so that there are a couple of premises that they have under this, uh, this term, white evangelicals. Uh, one of the premises is that there is a, a Christian agenda that we have to band together to push through, our, through the political system. Um, that's one of the bigger ones. Another one is this idea that there is this persecution that the Christians are facing um, here in the U.S. Um, and those are, those are two of the big ones. And so after reading that and after listening to it and trying to get a little more understanding, again, I'm kind of, you know, just reminded of this contend for the faith. Um, what I find interesting uh, about contend for the faith, it actually comes from the book of Jude. And if you guys are familiar with the scripture, you will know that the book of Jude 1 is one of the smallest books in the Bible. It's only one uh, chapter. Um, and, but also it comes before Revelation. And it's really interesting reading it because, you know, I think position is important. And so when you think about revelation, which as we all know, you know, be, reading the Bible and being, and being believers, we know that the book of Revelation really talks about the end times and what we should expect, um, you know, across the spectrum, whether you're a believer or not believer or what, but it talks about the things that we, we should expect in the end times. And so uh, reading the book of Jude, which I'm going to do today. So this uh, message, Consent for the Faith, is, is going to be a multi-part series. And I don't know how long it's going to be. <laughs> I'm going to just slow down and allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide because the important thing that we need to take away from this series, Contend for the Faith, is what is our posture supposed to look like? Like we know we're supposed to contend for the faith, but what does that look like? What does that look like in a society where there's so much social unrest, in a society where there's a lot of political unrest? What is the posture of the Christian supposed to look like within that society? And so that's one of the things I want us to really explore as we kind of go through this, you know, contend for the faith. Now, because the scripture and verse is, is so short, I'm going to actually read it in its entirety. And then we're going to talk about just different pieces that kind of stand out for me um, and then kind of talk about why they stand out for me. And like I said, just laying a foundation at this point, but I pray that you all will indulge me. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to bring it out. I uh, also encourage you to get a highlighter, get a notebook, something, you know, to help you capture how you feel and what you think. Because I really believe that I'm not just going through this lesson just for the sake of going through this lesson. I really believe that God has ordained me for this time to go through this message, Contend for the Faith, and it's for purpose. Because there are some believers who are struggling and trying to understand what their posture is supposed to be. And so I believe that as I go through this lesson, I believe that the Holy Spirit will not just impress upon my heart and my spirit what it is that I need to talk more deeply into, but I believe that he will impress upon the hearts and the spirits and the minds of those who hear it so that they too may understand what their posture is, what their uh, expected posture is during the season. And so with that said, I'm going to jump into the scripture. Uh, again, we're going from the book of Jude, which is, uh, again, the, the, the last book just before the book of Revelation. So if you go to the back of your Bible and then just go to the beginning of Revolution, Re Revelation, the book of Jude will either be the page, will be the page right before it, either on the left or the right side of your page. So that's the quickest and easiest way to get to it. And so I'm going to read the scripture from uh, the NIV version, which I always find a little bit easy, more easy to digest. And so we'll start with verse one. Uh, the book of Jude, chapter one, verse one, of course. And it says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be you, love be yours in abundance. And so this is just Jude um, addressing, uh, addressing uh, the people that he's talking to. And he says, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. And this first section where it starts right before uh, verse three, uh, in my Bible, it is entitled, The Sin and Doom of Ungodly People. And I'm going to bring this a little bit closer to me, although you guys can't see it. I'm having a 
hard time reading this on my tablet. Um, but he says, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license of immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting change for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn them him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain, they have rushed for profit into Balaam's era, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are, blank, are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up, their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved for forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires they boast about themselves and flatten others for their own advance or and flatter others for their own advantage. So we're going to go into uh, verse 17. Uh, and this is a call to perseverance is how this uh, it, it, it's a precursor to this, uh, to this section. And it says, but dear friends, remember that the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ were told, they said unto you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own godly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to, th to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And lastly, the doxology is to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before the glorious presence without fault and with great joy. And to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, there is so much neat, neediness in this book of Jude. Um, and it is something that, like I said, I, you know, I, I'm being led by the Holy Spirit to just kind of take a step back and really understand it. And when we talk about contending for the faith, we're not talking about contending for the faith for the sake of the faith, because the faith, as we know, will stand, excuse me, stand on its own. But when we talk about contending for the faith, what we're talking about is the reputation of Christianity, just in a very simple nutshell, the reputation of Christianity. Now, we understand that there will be people who will not believe the faith because of the reputation of the Christians that they have encountered, the examples that some Christians have shown them. When you think about people who don't believe in the faith, who don't believe in Christianity, or even people who have, um, you know, an active disdain 
for Christianity, two of the main reasons that they have that or, or say that they feel the way that they feel is one, they believe that Christians are either hypocritical, um, and then two, they believe that they are judgmental. And so these are some of the reputations, unfortunately, that some believers have um, amongst those who don't believe. And as a result of the reputation, some people choose not to believe because you, as the example of what Jesus Christ is supposed to look like, has fallen short in your presentation or your representation of the faith. And so when, a Christ, when the scripture talks about contending for the faith, it's talking about the reputation of the faith, but it's also talking about understanding what Christianity uh, is supposed to look like in the face of the world. And so when we look at the book of Jude, and we understand what, uh, what the scripture is talking about. There's a couple of things that I want to pull out um, just for your understanding, for your edification, and for you to write down, take notes, and uh, try to understand for yourself. So one of the things that it talks about, uh, just starting with the foundation itself, it says, uh, you know, it, it, Jude says, I felt compelled to write to you and to urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. So when we're talking about the faith in this book, we're talking about believers and what we understand the faith to be. We're not talking about non-believers. We're not talking about people who doubt the faith. We're talking about believers and what we know the faith to be. And so in the book of Jude, that's who, he, that's who he's talking about. But he's also talking about how people can be turned from the faith. And so I want to take you guys down to um, the fifth uh, uh, verse in that chapter. And it says that, though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe and the angels who did not keep their position. I think that's a very important thing to understand that not only did he destroy those who did not believe, but he also destroyed the angels who did not keep their position of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. And I think that is a key to understanding what your posture is supposed to be, what your position is supposed to be with regards to the time that we're in and concerning, you know, um, as believers contending for the faith, what is it that we are supposed to be showing the world in this season, in this season of social unrest, in this season of a pandemic, in this season of, season of political unrest, and all of this that we're seeing, what is our posture supposed to be? And we understand that, you know, in the scripture, it says that not only um, did the Lord destroy those who did not believe, but also the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. And so it is important, it is imperative that we as believers understand what our position is. And if one, he, 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 the scripture goes on to say that he has kept them in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. And so when I read this and I understand and I take a step back and I look at how people are actively acting in this season with regards to the faith and not just anybody, but the leaders, you know, those who have, who were set apart, those who were in positions um, of authority, how they are acting in these days. Um, you can't help but realize that some, you know, that there will be those who are out of order, that there will be those who are imbalanced, that there are, there will be those who will not represent the, the truth of God's word in this season um, and for various reasons. Um, and so it really is important to understand that. Another part that I want to share with you guys, it says, um, because what we're saying is, you know, you have people who are out here vehemently uh, 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 endorsing one thing over another. I mean, to the point where there is argument, that there is dispute, that there is so much wrath that is going on, whether it be things, you know, from a political perspective, whether it be things from a social perspective, there are people who are believers who are finding themselves on either side of a position, and they're fighting these positions as if these positions are anchored in the things of God. And we obviously need discernment to understand what our position is supposed to be, and I'll get into a little bit more about that. But what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to be anchored in the things of God and anything else has to be filtered through our anchoring, filtered through our understanding and filtered through discernment and filtered through the Holy Spirit. And so when we find ourselves on different sides of an issue and we're pointing fingers to those who are on the other side with contempt and with condemnation and all of these different things, then we have to know at a minimum that we are out of order and that we're out of position because that is not what God has called us to do. And so it goes on to say that, but uh, in, in um, uh, verse nine, it says, but uh, even the archangel Michael, 
when he was disputing with the devil. Now, Archangel Angel Michael is disputing with the devil. It is said um, about the body of Moses. It says the Archangel Michael did not himself dare to condemn the devil for slander, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. And so what that is telling us is that we're not to stand on either side of the aisle pointing fingers, rebuking one another because of our lack of understanding or for whatever, you know, reason that we find ourselves so committed and so anchored in our opinions and our thoughts. Um, and so even in that, when it said when Archangel Michael was disputing with the devil, he didn't even condemn the devil. So how dare we try to con condemn one another? How dare we try to condemn other brothers and sisters in the faith because they stand on a different side than us? When the reality is, and I say this often, you know, especially when it comes to political matters, you know, the reality is, is that if Jesus was walking the earth today, he would neither endorse the Republican nor the Democratic Party. So why do we as believers, as Christians, find ourselves so vehemently, you know, in defense of one of the one or the other? And so when we think about that and think about the position and the posture that you hold, you have to first and foremost, I pray, as God to give you wisdom and understanding and, and understand what your posture is supposed to be. But even the archangel Michael told the devil, he said, the Lord rebuke you. I'm not going to rebuke you, but the Lord rebuke you. And I want to drop down here um, to this point, which is, uh, and we'll do a, a lot more with this scriptures, but I, so I'm going to drop down, but we're going to, over the next several weeks, we're really going to dig into this thing and really personalize it and bring it home so that you can understand what your posture is supposed to be, because that's what you, you don't want to be, you don't want to be caught out of order. So understanding what your posture is supposed to be in this season. So I'll go down to the section that is entitled, A Call to Persevere. And in this section, it says that there will be people, um, uh, and that's uh, verse 19. It says, there, these are people who will divide you. Um, let me start. Let me, let me go up here a little bit further. It says, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last days, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. It says, these are people who will divide you, who follow more who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. So these are people that are acting out of impulse, acting out of, you know, their own um, attitudes, acting out of their own desires. And it says, and they're not, you know, uh, they do not have the spirit. They're, they're acting out of their own understanding, their own instincts, and they are not inquiring of the spirit of God on how they are to appear and approach and act on certain situations. Um, I think that is very key and very important to understand. But it also goes on to say in uh, verse 21, it says, keep yourselves in God, in God's love, as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. And so it says, keep yourselves in God's love. That is so key. Keep yourselves in God's love. And you guys know from 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about what love is. You know, love is patient, love is kind. He talks about all of that. So write that down, go back, study it, and understand what love, lo love looks like. And love is not contingent upon anything else. It is patient, it is kind. It is all these things in the midst of a pandemic. It is all these things in the midst of social unrest. It is all these things in the midst of social injustice. Love is patient, kind. Read um, 1 Corinthians 13 to understand that and understand what it's supposed to look like in the midst of whatever situation that's going on. And not only that, but that helps to influence you to understand what your posture is supposed to be in these days. Um, another part that I want to share with you guys is, uh, let me see, I think that, I think that was it. Uh, no, there's another part that I want to share. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's another part that I want to share with you. So 21, it said, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. But then I want to round out this thing, um, talking about verses 22 and 23, because this is where I think the action really comes into place. And this is where we have to get discernment. And it says to, uh, and, and it essentially talks about how we are to deal with ungodly people. And we're talking about people who, who don't believe in the faith. We're talking about people who, um, who don't believe either because they doubt it, don't believe because they don't like it. Whatever their reasons are, this scripture tells us, um, these two verses tell, tells us how we are to deal with those people. Um, in, in verse 22, it says, be merciful to those who doubt. 23, it says, save others by snatching them from the fire. And then three, it says, to others uh, show mercy mixed with fear. So there are three ways that uh, Jude is encouraging 
um, the men and women of God to deal with those who do not believe. And it says, one, be merciful to those who doubt. So there are people who don't believe because they don't have the understanding, but we are to be merciful to them. We're not to be condemning. We're not to, you know, uh, to, to hold them to contempt, but we're to be merciful to them helping them to gain a level of understanding. I always say this thing that we have to encourage, then influence. And so when, you, um, when you're put in a position where you have influence over people, then that's when you're able to, um, to help them gain some level of understanding. That's when you're able to um, you know, speak life into them. That's when you're able to teach and to correct and all those things. But it says to be merciful to those who doubt. The second thing that it tells us to do is save others by snatching them from the fire. And so you can imagine... Um, saving others from snatching them, snatching them from the fire, there's, a, there's another sense of urgency there. There's a different level of urgency there. Anytime you're talking about snatching someone from somewhere, that means that there's a sense of urgency. And so you don't have the luxury, unlike those who doubt, you don't necessarily have the luxury to help them get there. You have to be a little more, um, uh, 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 what is the word, a little more bold, a little more direct, um, but still with love you know, still boldness with love, direct with love, and, and also having the influence. The influence part is incredibly important. You're not going to snatch anybody from anywhere. You, you snatch somebody who don't know you and that you don't have influence over their life. You snatch them, they're going to snatch you back. So you have to have some level of influence for you to be able to respond to them in that way. Um, so they can trust that when you're snatching them, that you're snatching them for their own protection, even if they don't understand what the immediate danger is, but the fact that you rip them or grab them up is them understanding like, okay, there must be something that was dangerous for me because this person cares about me. And so the second way they say is to um, save others by snatching them from the fire. And then the third part, the third response, which I find is incredibly interesting, and I know that the Holy Spirit will continue to give me more revelation and understanding, and that we'll talk about this a little bit more in the weeks ahead. But the other part is almost a two-part, and it says, and to others, show mercy mixed with fear. Now, what does that mean, to show mercy but mixed with fear? The mercy part is, you know, again, giving them the, not necessarily the benefit of the doubt, but helping them to get there. But what you have to understand about this person is that they have their own ideology, they have their own understanding and their own ideas with regards to the faith. And so when you engage this person, if you are one, not Holy Spirit led, if you are two, not knowledgeable in the things of God, and, but if you're Holy Spirit led, then your level of knowledge is mixed with, uh, you know, the power of God who so gives you understanding. If you are not positioned to have those kind of conversations with people, then you may find yourself on the other side and you're not the one that's trying to teach about the faith, but you're being drawn away from the faith because you don't have the anchoring and the understanding of how to communicate or have conversations with people who, um, I guess, would dispute the faith just for the sake of disputing the faith. So even like Satan, I think about when Jesus was, you know, on the mountain and, 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 and Satan came and, and it said that Satan tempted Jesus. Jesus had knowledge of his purpose. He had knowledge of his posture. He had understanding of who God, not just who God is, but who he is in his life. And so he was able to uh, not be deceived by the tricks and the tactics of the enemy. And so when it talks about, um, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 talking to others with mercy and with fear, the fear part is the fear of not being deceived by them. And we understand through reading the word of God that many of us are deceived in the last days. And so having that understanding and knowing that there's a responsibility that we have to not be deceived while we contend for the faith is an important part to understand. Um, there's so much meat in this book of Jude. I encourage you guys to listen to this, this recording over and over again. In the next, you know, the weeks ahead, we will continue to delve into this message so much more deeply because there's a lot to know. There's a lot to gain. But I also encourage you that over this next week, that you, you know, study the word for yourself. Really sit down with the scripture and allow the Holy Spirit to minister it to you and to give you revelation. Um, of course, that 30 minutes went incredibly fast, but I thank God for each and every one of you. I continue to pray for you and encourage, continue to encourage you to contend for the faith and continue to pray for you as you contend for the faith. Thank you again for listening to Girlfriend Therapy Radio. I'm your host, Kwanzaa. I don't think I've mentioned that, but I love you guys, and I pray for you, and I ask that you continue to pray for me. And so until next week, next Wednesday. Same time, same place. I encourage you to tune in. And in the meantime, I bid you guys, guys, God's best blessings. So, blessings. Mm -hmm.